Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Brandi Kuhl. I'm the director of the Helen Crocker Russell Library at San Francisco Botanical Garden, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our event this evening. Uh, while we wait for people to uh, continue to attend, uh, I just want to tell you that we're going to use the Q&A feature during the talk, and we'll reserve time at the end to answer as many questions as we can. So tonight, uh, we are with Rob Badger and Nita Winter to talk about the making of Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. And Rob and Nita, I am so excited to welcome you both to speak with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's a treat to be here. We've really been looking forward to this. Uh, last week, we took a visit to the Botanical Garden and God, it was so beautiful. There were so many different flowers out. From uh, all over the world. Oh yeah, we went to the African section and the colors were just brilliant. Um, it's the first time we've been there in quite a while. We're embarrassed to say, but uh, it was just a treat <laughs> to walk through and see so many people and join the beautiful space that you've created. It's just wonderful. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, the garden is looking really beautiful right, right now. And this is this year, you know, people are really taking advantage of getting out into nature and our open space and enjoying the garden. So we're so happy to be able to to be there for our community. So I'm glad you guys came. Oh, yeah, it was a, it was a treat. Well, and thank you for making this book. It's just it's really beautiful. And um yeah, I think the having it in a book format really tells your story and the narrative and shares your photographs in a way that, um, you know, no digital way can really capture. So I just thank you for taking, and I'm sure it was a labor of love and we'll hear about it tonight, yeah. but um, thank you for making the book. You're welcome. We well, really it, enjoyed doing it and sharing it with the world. It, it was a labor of love and it in, in our project took us to so many different environments in the state of California that I mean play, places we had heard about but just didn't realize how beautiful they were until we got there and it, yeah it, it was a labor of love and a lot of hard work but everything was worth it to be able to share this with people like Nita said. Well I'll um introduce both of you. I'd like to say a little bit about your backgrounds, um, which are very impressive. So internationally acclaimed conservation photographers, Rob Thatcher and Nita Winter, have been life partners, activists, and creative collaborators for more than three decades. Rob's environmental images have won multiple awards, including best in photojournalism in international competition, and he was one of three American photographers chosen to document Russian nature preserves in Siberia. In 1998, he presented a slideshow documenting the impact of mining on our public lands at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. for the Sierra Club to support the Clinton administration's efforts to reform the antiquated 1872 mining law. Nita began her photographic career documenting her work fighting wildfires in Northern California and later as a national park ranger on Alcatraz. In 1986, Nita had her first major exhibit, The Children of the Tenderloin. This documentary project launched her career and directed her focus toward creating healthy communities. The series received extensive media coverage and showed her firsthand the power of photographic storytelling. Over the next 17 years, she produced and created portraits for six major public arts projects celebrating the Bay Area's diverse communities. Uh, their work has been featured in Time, Mother Jones, and Sierra Magazines, the New York Times, Washington Post, 
San Francisco Chronicle, and the Los Angeles Times. And they are the recent recipients of the Sierra Club's 2020 Ansel Adams Award for Conservation Photography. So Rob and Nita are excited to take you behind the scenes on their 27 year journey, photographing wildflowers throughout California and the West and the making of their beautiful book, The Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. Thank you. We will share our screen here so we can make our pictures larger. Thank you. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. We really look forward to being here uh, and on yet another Zoom call. Thank you for all of you who have come to attend. I hope the you haven't gotten Zoom zoomed out. We promise to make this as entertaining and beautiful as as we possibly can to keep you here. So thank you for attending. Um, as we said earlier, this is about our 27 year journey photographing throughout the state and the West documenting the beauty on our public lands, the, the great diversity of wildflowers. And uh, it ended up with a project that uh, helped create our coffee table book, Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change that we co-published with the California Native Plant Society last year. And it's received 12 awards, including the one that Brandy mentioned from the Sierra Club. So we were really pleased with that. And we really look forward to um, taking you behind the scenes and um, introducing you to the work that we do. So this all started in 1992. Uh, I was processing my film at a photo lab in San Francisco and came uh, noticed a fellow photographer, a friend of mine, uh, who said she had heard that the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve, a state park devoted to the preservation of the state flower, was having a really exceptional year after six bad years. And uh, she said, you know, I'm sure you've been to the Poppy Reserve and you've seen the flowers there. You've been photographing in California for years. I said, no, you know, actually I've never really been to the Poppy Reserve. She said, really? You're a, you're a nature photographer in California <laughs> and you haven't been there? Well, we really have to go. So she and a friend of ours and I went down, Joe from San Francisco, down to the Poppy Reserve, which is about an hour north of Los Angeles, and came across this just incredible bloom of California poppies and a great variety of other flowers you can see mixed in. What made this such a special year was that um, normally the Poppy Reserve, which is covered with in densely covered with flowers of, and with, with California poppies, but this year, you can see that there was a great diversity of flowers, including these beautiful purple tipped uh, bird's eye gilia. Um, and so it was a windy day as it often is there. And I just stood there and watched the waves of wind move across these glowing flowers from right in front of me way off to the distance. It was just mesmerizing, it was hypnotic. It was something like I had never ever seen before. And so uh, that evening I called Nita and said, you know, I, I, I just described to her what it was I saw and how much in awe I was of this uh, beauty that's been preserved on our public lands. I said, you know, you just have to, see this. So a couple days later, I drove back home. We got, I got Nita, drove back down, and then we spent a few days photographing in this area, both inside the Poppy Reserve and outside. And this is BLM land. And I was a people photographer at the time, and I had an assignment when Rob went down, so I couldn't go down. But it, I was so grateful that he was willing to drive six hours back to come get me so that I could experience this as well. And we both grew up in the Northeast. So we had never seen wildflower blooms like this before. And we were hooked. We wanted to keep um, photographing wildflowers and finding out about them. And that started our 27 year journey. So this is what introduced both of us and gave us the desire to photograph as much as we could, these uh, these landscapes that were slowly vanishing to not only climate change, but land development. 
Yeah, at that time, we weren't really thinking about climate change, but over the years, it became more and more of an issue. So as I mentioned, I was a people photographer. I um, started my career working on a project on the children of the Tenderloin. And Rob was a, basically a nature and landscape photographer. Mm -hmm. and, and we met in a uh, photo lab. I was waiting for my prints and this print showed up. So over the years, we decided to collaborate and focus on the wildflowers. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that transition happened. And it took about five and a half couples counselors to help us um, work through actually working together, which is a challenge for a lot of couples. And we, have, we love doing it. And we have really, really different personalities. So we've learned to blend them over the years. So uh, people often ask me, ask us, what is the oldest image in the book? What was the earliest uh, date? time that you photographed wildflowers. And I said, well, um, this image was taken two years by before I met Nita in 1984. I had been looking for a beautiful picture of a California buckeye tree. And I was in the uh, hills around Carmel and looking for uh, wonderful buckeye trees at sunset. And I came across this scene with these pretty purple flowers in there. I didn't know what they were at the time, but um, I said, well, I, this was just add to the composition of the tree. So uh, this was the earliest image uh, that people will see in the book. And again, it was in 1982. And as okay. Nita mentioned, when she met me, I would already been a landscape and environmental issues photographer. And uh, I had been doing that for 25 years and wanted to do more with my work than just create pretty pictures for books and landscapes and magazines. So I, I was fortunate to connect with uh, a land conservation or organization, the National Trust for Public Land, and uh, I was hired to do over 30 projects for them throughout the West that helped to pro, uh, that helped convey public land, I mean private land, into public land. So this is a uh, this was private land, privately held ranch land in the Sierra Nevada foothills that was adjacent to Sequoia National Park. So uh, the Trust for Public Land was able to acquire this land, and it became. So uh, part of Sequoia National Park and uh, told me that there was a lot I can do with beautiful photography that also helped promote conservation efforts. And you did about 30 different projects. So it was able to, and often I could go as well and took us to some really interesting private land. And uh, I had also been photographing environmental issues of in the introduction, it was mentioned that I did a slideshow uh, for, for the Sierra Club on mining on public land at the National Press Club. And I'd been doing this project for about five or six years and it was just getting really burned out seeing all the negative impact that our humans population had been doing on, on the land. So um, I, I just decided that I wasn't gonna do this anymore and really focus on using the beauty of nature to help get people's attention to the important conservation and environmental issues of, of our time. And as I mentioned, I was a people photographer. The image on the right is from the Children of the Tenderloin series. And before that, um, as Brandy mentioned, I was a firefighter. I was the first female firefighter up in Leggett, Northern Mendocino County. And this is, I kept a uh, camera on my belt and this was a photograph that I took um, of a pile of large tires from land moving equipment that, were, that was burning. And this actually won my first photo competition award in an international Nikon competition. And the image on the left is from a powwow. It was taken at a powwow in San Francisco. And I uh, worked with Taya Schrack, who was a wonderful um, artist and hand colorist, and she hand colored a, um, a whole series of, image of images over the year for the Children's Defense Fund calendars. And on the right is one of the public art projects 
uh, that was mentioned and it was called the faces of, so it was the faces of the canal, uh, Marin City, Vallejo and Novato. And these are seven foot banners that would hang in the streets. And um, I ended up having some health problems. And so I decided to stop doing the people photography for a while, but it actually allowed me to go out in the field with Rob and photograph wildflowers. So th this, was an, this was a picture that we met. Uh, this was a picture that someone on the trail we met took of us while uh, we had backpacked into El Dorado National Forest, Lake Winnemucca, which is just a little bit south of Lake Lake Tahoe. It's it's the convergence of a, a many different eco regions, which meant there would be a great diversity of flowers and plants there. So we decided instead of doing day hikes in and spending time hiking in and hiking back out, we would backpack in there and get as many flowers as we could. Uh, so at that time, I was carrying 85 pounds of camping gear and photo gear, and Nita was carrying 65 pounds, and we did that <laughs> once, and we decided never to do it again because it was just so much weight to carry. But um, later on, we'll tell you how we photographed the plants out in the field without just without disturbing them and using natural light, natural light to capture the plants in their most beautiful light. And this was taken in um, probably the second week of, uh, of September. And this, due to climate change, we have these severe droughts and then we also have these deluge of rain and snow. And this year there had been so much snow that the flowers were actually three to four weeks late. So we were there after Labor Day when everybody was gone um, and was able to still photograph flowers. And we'll talk a little bit more about what, um, what the problems are when the flowers are at different, uh, bloom at a different time than they normally do. And in order to pay for the project, we were able to sell artwork for, to our consultants and architects to be built into mostly medical centers. And this is um, eight foot tall, 20 foot wide lobby divider. And this was one of seven of these. And there were 34 images built into this architecture. So this is an image of California poppies. And uh, I developed a way to gently get the flower petals in contact with the lens. Uh, it's called the contact series. And uh, it allowed me to get more uh, abstract forms into my photography instead of the strict, uh, very, very sharp botanical portraits that you'll see later. And we'll describe this process later on. And we actually have photographed wildflowers in California every month of the year, but there aren't very many in the winter. And so we like to go out to um, wildlife preserves and photograph the birds. This, the first one was Woodbridge uh, Preserve near Sacramento. This is Merced National Wildlife Refuge along with this one. And these were images that were also used in medical centers because nature has been known to help with the healing process and reducing uh, the need for pain medication. So one of the most frequent questions we're asked is, well, you know, well, Robinita, you've seen, you know, you've been photographing wildflowers for 27 years. What's the most beautiful bloom you have seen? Well, in 2003, uh, in the Tehachapi Mountains, about an hour north of Los Angeles, where Interstate 5 goes through, going north to Bakersfield, there's, um, there was this amazing bloom that I had never seen before. And I'd been traveling up and down that road, going through that pass uh, near the town of Gorman for about 50 years, and I'd never seen anything like this. So, and they actually called it a 50-year bloom. That they didn't, that the conditions generally don't come together like this, um, except every 50 years. So where the uh, freeway went through at the bottom of the, of the valley to the top of the ridges in these mountains was a thousand feet high. And this bloom extended a mile to a mile and a half wide. It was all flowers. 
and we were there uh, right after a storm. We'll get to that. So uh, this is a detail uh, of some of the flowers that uh, you're seeing from a more distant pers perspective. And one of the great things about this area is that there's public land on the west side of the freeway. It's called Hungry Valley State Vehicular Recreation Area. So we were able to drive up on dirt roads and look back across to the hills, which um, in the background there are actually private land, but we're hoping that someday they will be protected. So as I mentioned before, for a mile and a half wide and, and a thousand feet high, the hills were just covered with flowers. And we uh, got there at the tail end of a, of a late spring storm. And so as the storm was clearing, there were these beautiful shafts of light shining on the landscape with this wonderful gray background with the clouds. So the the uh, the light was changing and everywhere I looked, it was just beautiful. The hardest thing to do was, was to settle on a composition in this beautiful landscape with all the changing light. It was so hard because everything was so beautiful. And our second favorite place, favorite bloom was actually in Carrizo Plain in 2017. And many of you have probably uh, were either out there or heard about it. And what's interesting in this photograph is the difference between a north facing slope uh, with lots of flowers and the south facing slope on the left with very few flowers because it gets it dries out more quickly. And this we were coming from Bakersfield and heading west into Carrizo Plain. So we came over the Tembler Mountains. On the other side, of Carrizo Plain is the Caliente Mountains. And they're both running north and south. And um, we had been told that there were a lot of desert candles up there. And we had only seen a few over the years. And we came around the corner and here was tens of thousands of them. And it was just amazing. And one of the things that's really fun about the desert candles besides them being quite tall is that the stems are hollow. And so the light will come through the stems. So often people ask us, well, you've photographed hundreds of flowers. Do you have a favorite one? And my favorite one is the desert candle because it's such a unique flower. It's just got so many different colors to it. And like Nita said, because the stem is hollow, sometimes it just looks like it glows. So that's, that, that's my favorite flower of all, all the flowers we've been photographing for 27 years. And what's interesting too, is this is actually in the mustard family. So this is the Carrizo Plain and I included the road in, in the photograph to give a sense of scale as, as to how expansive this beautiful super bloom was. Uh, you are looking east from the Caliente range that we were just talking about toward the Tembler range and Bakersfield would be sort of over the hill directly in front of us beyond the beyond the mountains. So the flowers extended way beyond the frame of the photograph to the left, which is north, and to the right, which is south. Close to 60 miles, right? Yeah. yeah. And this is a detail of some of the flowers that were that we were seeing from the distance. And this image was taken with an iPhone, an iPhone 6. So um, we figured out that we have used 11 or 12 cameras over the 27 years, including the iPhone. And we included in the book a, a section and also the exhibit called Behind the Scenes. We really like taking people behind the scenes and showing them how we uh, create the images. So I'm going to take just a little bit of time to describe how we do all this work out in the field with natural light. On the left-hand side, in the top uh, left corner is what we call a botanical portrait. So we isolate the flower from its setting, place a black or white background behind our subject to eliminate dis to eliminate distracting background. So we'll do black or white, and our goal is to get the flower uh, 
it's sharp and show as much detail. So we call this a botanical portrait. And it's the flowers are always still attached to the plant. We never cut the flowers to photograph them. So after just putting black or white backgrounds behind the flowers, I got pretty bored with that. And I thought, well, is there another way to show the beauty of the flowers and add another you know, artistic element to it? So I came up with a uh, with an idea to wrap the flowers in a fabric, either black or white, and uh, add the composition of the folds of the fabric uh, to the whole image to help make things a little bit more interesting. And this this is a this is a time consuming process because first I'd have to find the best angle to view the flower, and then play a while with the fabric and the folds to to get the fold just right. So it was a lot of trial and error to get these compositions. And we ended up with a chiff chiffon fabric, which is very lightweight. And if there was much of a breeze, um, it would often change the composition of the folds. So we'll show you some of the wrap series later. And, and, and again, I was looking for another way to uh, uh, show the beauty of these flowers. And I and I created a way to bring the uh, flowers petals gently in contact with the front of the lens. And so doing that, uh, I was blocking the lens, I was blocking the light falling on the uh, uh, flower itself with the lens and the camera. So the only other available source of light was light coming from the background. So the light coming from the background was being transmitted through the flower petals and it gave this nice translucent soft and abstract effect to the uh, beautiful shape uh, and color of the flower. So and this- Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. So by the background, we're not saying we're putting a background in there, but from the light that's behind the flower. Right. So it would be grasses or or the sky or whatever. So I always made sure that I had uh, some elements of the image in focus so people could actually see what some of the detail was with the uh, uh, flowers I was photographing. And again, this gave me another creative outlet and, and another way to show people the beauty of the flowers. And I'm grateful for the response that we get for these particular type of images that aren't just straight botanical portraits. And it also took Rob off the uh, off the tripod. So it was a much more spontaneous type of approach. And um, these images we consider his, hers, and ours. Um, and lots most, of hours. Lots of hours um, and hours. And um, it was a very collaborative process. I was called eagle eyes as a child because I would find money on the beach. And, and so I was really good at finding the flowers. And then Rob, who's a Capricorn was, and had a lot of patience, was really good at, at looking at the composition. And then um, we would take a look at it together, but he was willing um, to be behind the camera and sometimes in very uncomfortable positions, as you'll see. Nina found this flower the previous evening and it was too dark to photograph. I was still photographing with film. This was in probably 1998. 98, your 50th birthday. Yeah, this was my 50th birthday. So uh, we decided we'd come back in the morning. We came back in the early morning so that it would, there would be very, very little wind at this time of day in the desert. This was in Anza Borrego Desert State Park, east of San Diego. Um, so the light was coming in at a very low angle, and uh, in, it was, it was uh, illuminating just one side of the plant and the other side of the plant, and, and the blossoms there were all in shadow. So we had to bounce light in. We took one of these windshield protector uh, screens that have like an aluminum coating on it and bounce the light in there. So the left side and the right side had light, but the front facing the camera didn't have light. So we had to set up this plastic fabric and bounce light in, in there. And I was doing uh, 
Polaroid pictures every time I I changed the lighting. And this this flower took two and a half hours to do because I was doing film and Polaroids. But in the end, it was worth it because this was an amazing desert lily uh, with so many blossoms like I had never seen before. Normally, this plant is about two feet high, uh, maybe two and a half feet high, and it is white blossoms alternating going up the stems. But this year, uh, there was so much rain, we figured that the plant was putting out three stalks instead of just one and putting so much energy into producing seeds for, for the seed bank. And I also wanted to point out on the left side where you see the jackets and the camera bag, those were put there purposely to shade both the sand and the leaves so that they wouldn't be distracting. And um, some people have noticed our little family friends there, um, our rabbits and uh, Rob's spiritual advisor and art critic Zorro, who's uh, a monkey who travels with us a it, lot. He's in the black hat. And, and, and so as you see, we didn't have the light on the, on the sand as it would be distracting. We live five miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. And so we are fortunate that 40% of the uh, county is protected land, public land. And there's an amazing, amazing amount of diversity found here. So we'll be taking you through some more uh, what we call setup photos to give you a sense of what goes into it. And as I said, I was really grateful that Rob was willing to really suffer um, in some of these really awkward positions. And as uh, also, as we said before, uh, it was our commitment to do no damage to either the flowers or to the immediate environment where we were photographing. And so, um, Everything was done with natural light. We used diffusers and reflectors, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And not, and some of the equipment was very basic, not, not very fancy. Um, wind breaks were often um, needed if there was a breeze, especially when we were doing film. Rob packed up this. I was in uh, traffic school that day and uh, it started to pour two minutes after he packed up. Uh, as we said before, again, we do white backgrounds and black backgrounds and take the images home and decide what it is we like and you know, what we think best represents the beauty of that flower. And as Rob mentioned, um, we're, we're really careful about where we um, photograph most of the time it's right next to a trail or a road and um, if we can't get access to it without doing damage we will walk away and say we will not photograph that flower and so again here is the wind um, break created again by um, uh, windshield shades and we try different angles you know, we don't always want to come straight on to a flower from the front. And when it really gets windy, we've had to set up uh, wind breaks, a, a tent that will really um, cut down on the wind. I was photographing this beautiful, brilliant Franciscan paintbrush uh, near, Rode near Rodeo Beach in uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And the first image I got I wanted to get as much of the plant with the blossoms as, as possible for a nice botanic portrait. But as I look closer, I could see uh, that the tips of this beautiful paintbrush just look like red, red flames. So I, so I zoomed in and got a really, really good close up. Uh, again, it's another way to show the beauty of the flower and kind of abstracting it in a in a composition but still showing some of the detail and such as the sticky um uh hairs that are on the on the plant that you don't normally see so when you're out in the field there are just so many ways to to photograph the flowers and we timed uh, 
grew uh, over a period of months, we kind of timed it and figured out we were spending an average of, uh, of about an hour with each flower. But it's really well worth it, you know, when you spend so much time, you can really find the, you know, really try to find the most beautiful way to photograph these flowers you know, and show them in their best light. And this is um, the old stage road, one of our favorite areas um, in Marin County. And it's um, on the way to the West Point Inn. And we love this Western Azalea because they're beautiful, but we also love them because of the fragrance. They have a really strong, beautiful perfume type fragrance. And we saw some beautiful azaleas in the botanical garden that also right. has some wonderful scents when we were there. So it's not only just the beauty, but as I'm sure I'm, many of you flower lovers know, it's, it's, uh, it's the fragrances that these flowers have. And this up in Northern California. And you don't always have to center things. Think about putting it off to the side. And as we mentioned, often by the side of the road, and Rob said we use diffusion discs to control the light. And you can use them in different, they can be straight overhead, they can be to the side, they can, in this case, we wanted to do it from the back um, so that you look like the light was coming through the petals. And then we had to put reflectors in front of the camera so that we could fill the light back in so it wasn't um, too dark in the, in the, um, on the camera side. One of our favorite areas in Marin is actually um, Ring Mountain in Corte Madera, and that's Mount Tamalpais in the background. And it was created because of the Tiburon mariposa lily, which is only found on Ring Mountain in several populations. And actually it's probably blooming right now. We saw it was starting to come up uh, when we were up there about two weeks ago, yeah. three weeks uh -huh. ago. It's a really, really strange looking willy. And, it... and again, the, uh, the rap series. This was uh, when you um, have really distracting backgrounds, you may want to wrap it. And in this case, there was a breeze. So we had to put rocks down to keep um, the fabric still. And this is up at 11,000 feet in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's Morgan Pass. and another wrap series. Again, trying to make the folds an interesting part of the, of the image and complementing the geometry of the, uh, of the flowers. So we'll photograph uh, the flowers sometimes under sunlight as well as under diffuse light and uh, go back home and look at them on the screen and decide which one it is we like best. Well, with this particular iris, when we photographed it in the sunlight, uh, the, the sun uh, highlighted all these beautiful uh, white specks on the petals that you don't get to see very well uh, on the uh, photograph of the flower under diffuse light. And sometimes we'll photograph it both ways. And and many times we will play around with the light while we're out in the field and then decide uh, how we want to photograph it. But there are times when we'll do it both ways. So another question we get is, well, how much, how, how much Photoshop do you do on all these images? Uh, so the answer is, well, we uh, capture raw files in the camera and then we have to take them into Photoshop and uh, and and process them, and then uh, do our best to uh, have the processing result show exactly what it was we say we saw and we felt what we felt when we were there. So in this image, of uh, the camera captured the actual light that was photo that was falling on the scene, which was blue skylight. This was in the shade. 
the only part of of this image that was in the sun is in the very very top uh middle of the frame and you can see there's a little bit of uh, bright late sunlight falling on the area that isn't in the shade so after we uh process the image in photoshop uh, again our goal is always to show as realistically as we can what it was we saw there this was what we saw and what we felt and one thing i want to add is that with the professional cameras and not with the with the iPhones, you have very low contrast and very low saturation, which actually gives us more control later uh, when we are processing the image. So that was Serviceberry in the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon. And this was also uh, created up in um, Mount Tamalpais. And we needed a really big background because it was a fairly large plant. So we had brought out a big fabric that had wrinkles in it. So we take it into Photoshop and we clean up the background. But we did start with a white background. And this is how it appears in the two page spread in the book. So we're always looking for different angles to, um, to uh, show the flower. And um, we deal with wind. Um, umbrellas are really good to block the wind. We're up uh, above Independence um, in the east side of the Sierra. And it was so windy that we were dealing with a lot of blowing sand. So we have two pieces of fabric to slip it under this plant, which is very low to the ground. And there's all the sand on it. So we take it into Photoshop. We clean up the background. We bring the saturation and the contrast back up to what we remembered the plant to be. And again, the two page spread. And we deal with wind, as I mentioned, and rain um, and heat. We also deal with bugs. Uh, our worst experience with the bugs was in Utah. We went to Capitol Reef and we were there for a number of days and we were on our way to Taos, New Mexico. We, I had been wanting to photograph these flowers. We saw them by the side of the road. We got out of the car in the middle of nowhere. And within three minutes, the no see found us. And no see if you don't know what they are, they bite and their bite is worse than mosquitoes. And they are so small that they'll go up your nose and into your ears and into your clothes. So I actually was forced to go back to the car, find some clean underwear that we could put over our heads in order to um, keep the bugs out. And, and this, that, that okay. photograph was in probably 90, 95 degree heat. Yeah. So um, oftentimes when I'm photographing these flowers uh, on the ground, um, I mean, with me lying on the ground, I, I can only photograph certain parts of the day because I'm just getting- Yeah, the sand would, had become too hot to, to photograph on. But it's all worthwhile, even through all the bugs and all the things, because when we take so much time to get the exact composition and lighting that we want, we're able to bring back, you know, these beautiful images of these native species that we get to share with everybody. And Rob had, we figured he must have had about 200 bites on him on that trip. So we had been photographing throughout the West and we met Joan Jasper, the curator at the Jewett Gallery at the San Francisco Main Library. And she asked us to do an, a um, series just on California. So we did Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. And we ended up with a hundred images in this exhibit. And we also included things like the guidebooks that we might use. Um, I, I like working with um, binoculars when looking for flowers. And then we also have knee pads, which are really important when you wanna be photographing on the ground. And so Ergodyne makes these wonderful um, gel knee pads that feel like you're, you're kneeling in stiff jello. And Brandy will be letting people know in the follow-up email if you're interested in finding out more about them. And so this exhibit, um, 
helped us create the traveling exhibit. This had 100 images in it. The traveling exhibit, which has been seen by over 45,000 people, now has 52 images in it. And this is what it looks like, uh, part of it right now at the Los Altos History Museum. And it's up there until July 11th. And um, there's, it's moving to some other places and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember where they are, but if you check our website, you'll be able to keep track of that. We're also really tickled that the San Diego Natural History Museum decided to make a large print version of our traveling exhibit and called it California Blooming, Wildflowers and Climate Change in Our Golden State. And this is a semi-permanent exhibit with fl flowers up to, I mean, with images up to 12 feet tall. So this was a mock-up that they sent us when we needed to pre prepare the files. And you have to be really careful when you prepare files that go 12 feet tall because a tiny bit of speck will now be six inches. And so this is um, part of that exhibit and it will be up for at least a year. And um, I think, we're talking to them about another seven months beyond that. And so we wanted to expand on the uh, text panels and the educational panels that were in the exhibit and um, spread the messages of hope and encourage people to take action around climate change, land conservation, species extinction. So we decided to do a book and we wanted to have many diverse voices tell the wildflower story. So we were able to pull together some absolutely wonderful people. Peter Raven in the upper left is a world renowned um, botanist and the former director of the Missouri Botanical Gardens. He wrote our forward and a wonderful story on the origin of California's um, plants. Jose Gonzalez, right next to him, he wrote a wonderful story. He's the founder of Latino Outdoors, wrote a wonderful story about um, connecting to nature. So our, um, the age range was 20 to 82. And we had, um, out of the 16 authors, we had 11 women. So we're gonna show you more images throughout the book. These are um, all the, these are some of the organizations that we collaborated with. Uh, we couldn't have done this book on our own and uh, with the help of the California Native Plant Society and many uh, of its members, we made the book possible and the images that we're going to continue to, to show you. And that's because people knew where to find the flowers and we were able to, to learn um, where to go. So the book is divided into three sections, the gift of beauty, the human connection, and ensuring the future. Which includes 25 different things you can do to make a difference. So Gordon Lepig is a, a scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. He wrote the story on wildflowers and climate change. Ryan Burnett, who's with uh, Point Blue Conservation Science, wrote this wonderful story about the research he was doing on the effects of climate change on the um, epic migration from Mexico to the northeast, northwest, and possibly Alaska of the Rufus hummingbird. And so this image that you're seeing of the Rufus hummingbird. Can we, can we talk about the climate change first before? Oh, sure. Um, and if the if the I mentioned earlier that the flowers had bloomed three to four weeks late. Well, that could be too late for the Rufus hummingbird that needs the fuel to, to do this epic migration. If it blooms too early, the, the uh, buds can, can freeze and you don't have the flowers. Or if it's too late, the hummingbirds will suffer, but also the flowers if they don't have their pollinators there when they need them. Uh, so this is the luckiest image that I've that we've ever gotten in the 27 years we've been photographing. We were photographing this beautiful, tall, scarlet fritillary and table rocks, upper table rocks, uh, which is in Oregon. Uh, 
we it's a tall lily and it moves in the slightest breeze so nita was standing there for quite a while waiting for the breeze to die down while i was looking at this whole scene through the viewfinder i was uh, i had my eye right on the viewfinder i had my uh, hand on the remote release i had the right shutter speed to stop the movement of the flower and I'm as I'm looking through there, this the beautiful bird comes in. I get two frames and it's gone. Well, we spent 20 minutes waiting for the bird <laughs> to come back, and it never did. So the image on the right is the raw file that we got out of the camera. And you can see that we need to do things in Photoshop to get it back to what it was we actually saw. So this was the luckiest photograph that we've gotten over the past 27 years of photographing wildflowers. And this, um, as you can see, was actually taken as a vertical. And we work with very large um, cameras with very large resolution, 36 megapixels, 42 megapixels. So we could do the hospital work. And also it would allow us to crop in and be able to take this image, crop part of it. And this one is actually 55 inches wide in our exhibit. So we included some of the uh, words of, from the National Wildlife Federation on pollinators in encouraging people to plant natives. We have a story on California's five deserts. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a Native American botanist and um, a writer and did a wonderful story on what's in a name from a number of different perspectives, including her heritage. Wendy Takuda, who was a um, news anchor in the Bay Area, some of you may know her. When she retired, she began to do restoration work and broom pulling. So she wrote this wonderful, very funny story called Zen and the Art of Pulling Broom. Amber Paris talking to children about climate change without scaring them. Also works in talking to people who don't really understand climate change who are our adults. Genevieve Arnold from Theater Pain Foundation about seed banking. And there's this also a, a section on, in the book on fire recovery, fire ecology, what happens after a fire goes through. Uh, and so th we, we photographed some of the burn areas where things were just devastated and saw how life was returning. Uh, it, it was just amazing to see life coming back in an in a area that had been burned and just, just devastated by wildfire, wildfires. And what we found is that um, the flowers really like the ash that as a fertilizer and if they get the right rain this is only six months after a fire in lake county and this was the how much growth was coming back so this area was all totally burned and this like nita said six months later was was the beauty that we were able to capture and bulbs in particular um really like to come back and because now they have the sun um that was they were deprived of uh when the trees were uh, in foliage. This area had been completely burned. If if you looked at the soil, uh, the, it was all it was all charred. And what it does is also cleans the thatch, the old grasses, et cetera, that were there. This area was burned, and this area was burned. You can see in the uh, uh, top left that of uh, these these pine trees had been burned, but these beautiful California poppies and all the other cream plants, cups and the cream cups and tidy tips came back after the fire. And um, this was the Tubbs fire, the one that went through uh, Santa Rosa and did so much destruction, killed so many people. And these are some of the um, portraits that we did in that area. Nita found these two flowers together. We didn't move them next to each other so sometimes you see these beautiful uh pairings of different colored flowers that make just an extraordinary composition all these images are are in the book 
like we said. Well, not all the setups, but most. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we want to take you to some to uh, some of our favorite areas, which is the desert when it's not hot. And this is uh, Death Valley. This was, I think, 2016 Super Bloom. So the yellow band at the bottom is all these beautiful desert sunflowers. And I'll, also, it's sometimes nice to show the areas that, the, you know, the land, the landscape, the rocks that these flowers grow in. So I took this image to show this beautiful scattering of, again, the desert sunflower in a totally different environment. And this is the same year. So we're in another part of the park and there doesn't seem to be that much blooming here. But if you look carefully in among the rocks, we found the desert broom rape and then wrapped it in fabric. And then we like to look for insects that are on the flowers as well, it's part of the ecosystem. And in 1998, we went to our first 100 year bloom in Death Valley. And that was what they used to call the super blooms uh, when all the conditions came together. They used to call 100 year blooms. Well, they used to call 100 year blooms, excuse me. Um, when the conditions generally would only come together every hundred years to get this type of bloom. And now with climate change, they're happening more often. And so now they call them super blooms. So this is uh, Joshua Tree National Park, which is another one of our favorite parks because it encompasses two different deserts. Northern part is the Mojave Desert and the Southern part is the Sonoran Desert, uh, the Colorado Desert. So Joshua Tree uh, is so much granite and the soil weathers into this coarse uh, granitic soil. And it's just beautiful to see these flowers growing out of of uh, just this thing that looks like nothing could absolutely grow there. So this is a, a desert Canterbury bell in an average year. This is about the height of the flower normally. Uh, well, in 1998, again, there was an El Nino year with an abundance of rain and the flowers in this wash near Cottonwood campground uh, were just growing a abundantly and they were growing taller and taller than they normally did because the rain kept coming and there was an abundant uh, amount of rain. So it was just fascinating to see these flowers and the, uh, the different types of flowers growing out of something that just didn't look like soil at all that we're used to. And these are some of the other flowers that we've found in this case in Joshua tree, but also can be found in other other deserts in the area. And another favorite place to photograph uh, is the Anza Borrego Desert State Park, which is in the Colorado Desert, uh, like I mentioned before, which is part of the Sonoran Desert. And we particularly like the, the southern part of the of the park because there are fewer people there. So we're always looking for new, well, you know, different ways to photograph the flowers with, you know, interesting backgrounds. So this was granite under blue skylight. And so instead of correcting it for the blue skylight, the, the blue light on the granite was a nice color uh, contrast to the intense yellow flowers. So here's the two page spread with the, um, the desert lily that we mentioned on the right and then the desert chicory on the left. And again, looking for a different angle than most people would. And when we went back to the um, Anza Borrego in 2005 for the second 100 year bloom, um, we had some rain nine out of 12 days. So we had rare fog that we found at the, uh, in the desert. And our other favorite place to photograph is where it all started in 1992 in the Antelope Valley, California Poppy Reserve. 
this I get this was an abundant year and there was a great variety of flowers and we particularly like this because you know here it's spring in the desert and still snow in the mountains north of the Los Angeles basin I think those are the San Gabriel mountains there are wonderful ground details so not only are we looking for you know vast panoramic landscapes we're also looking for details like uh, I photographed uh, and we showed earlier in uh, Joshua Tree. And this was taken the same weekend as the um, the ones in Gorman, those gray clouds in Gorman. So we left Gorman and came out to um, the poppy reserve. It's a gray day, so all the poppies are closed. But as you can see, it's just poppies in this area, not the mix that Rob had initially. So one of the reasons we did this project was to try to um, encourage people to make a difference, to take action, to vote, to plant, join, donate, volunteer. And our website has more information on that and so does the book. You can also become a citizen community scientist and iNaturalist and Nature's Notebook are two of the areas, that, uh, the websites that you can um, get involved with in uploading your photographs and data. And you don't have to know the name, they will help uh, identify uh, what you have there. So, so some of the images, I mean, some of the flowers in the book were photographed out of state. Uh, um, this beautiful prickly poppy was photographed in the Great Basin Desert in Nevada. And this species also occurs in California. So we have a few images in the book were uh, like the hummingbird, like like the hummingbird, uh, where that species is out of state, but also lives in California. So we wanted to include it, and also, like I said before, we're always looking for interesting backgrounds for the flowers. So we found this beautiful serpentine boulder. Serpentine is the state rock uh, in the Sierra foothills, with this wonderful blue dicks. Uh, flower right in front of it. So I was able to capture the flower again with a different background. Another favorite area to go to in Northern California is Table, uh, North Table uh, Mountain Preserve. And these are some of the alpine um, or subalpine flowers. And again, these, these are two page spreads that are found in the book. And it took us three years to put the book together, 27 years of photography, three years to put the book together. And here are a few of the websites that are helpful in identifying uh, plants. Uh, PlantID.net, especially good for people who are beginners. Calflora, a little more advanced and, and can show you um, what particular um, species are in different areas. And Calscape is the California Native Plant Society um, website. And what's really fun there is they have the gardenplanner.calscape.org where you can input your uh, location and what your uh, land is like and they will make recommendations on what native plants are good for that area and are local to that area. Wildflower Reports, Theater Pain Foundation has a great one, especially for Southern California. CNPS Facebook pages um, are good places to get a sense of what's happening. DesertUSA.com is also a great one for not only California, but some of the other states in the West. So we'll take you through a few more spreads. Don't go so fast. And then open up to questions. These are orchids that are found in California. So the book uh, has a uh, ecological regions of California page and 
uh just it describes briefly all the different types 14 of 14 different the ecological regions yeah and this is also in the exhibit and it's it, it has a glossary um because there's maybe terms the average person is does not uh know the meaning of which in the different essays so we included that and two indices one a plant based on plant names and the other one on locations so you can see um if particular species are in the book from a from a specific location. So the book is available in two forms. One is the regular edition book, which the, um, the uh, Botanical Garden is actually has available in their shop right now. And um, we also have a deluxe signed limited edition book that comes with a signed and numbered tip-in page, a special cover, and a um, clamshell box to put it in. And if you um, get a hold of the regular edition book, we encourage you to um, take the dust jacket off and look at the the book that the book the cover, cover that's underneath the hardcover book cover. So, so thank you, thank you for does for spending your time with us we saw we didn't lose very many people so we're grateful for everyone who stayed throughout the whole presentation you can learn more about our book at wildflowerbooks.com and the book is also for sale um through the botanical gardens or if you end up doing it through our website let us know that you came through this program and we will give a percentage to the to the gardens and there's also a lot of information and videos, et cetera, on the website. And um, we always love to hear from people. If you have questions beyond tonight, feel free to contact us. And so we like to we like to end with this wonderful quote from David Brower: "The truth and beauty can still win battles. We need more art, more passion, and more wit." in defense of the earth. So thank you for joining us. And we are open now to taking questions. Well, thank you, Rob Anita. That was just an amazing story. It's really inspirational, your passion for photography and native plants. Thank you. Um, so I would like to open it up for questions. Feel free to uh, use the Q&A feature, and we do have a few that have come in already. Can you see? Um, I think you may have mentioned this briefly, but one of the questions is, do you photograph at Table Mountain? Yes, we, yes, we do. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful area. We've been photographing over the years and seeing how it's gone through different land agencies to, you know, finally protect as much as they possibly could. And what makes that environment so interesting is, it's just uh, so much of the land is volcanic rock. And so you'll have uh, a little bit of soil here that's got one kind of flower or one grouping of flowers on it and an area where there is a lot more soil and you, and you see different species. So what's so wonderful about that place is that, is that the, the geology of the area is so close to the surface uh, and where there's some water, you'll see some kind of plants and very little water or others. So it's a great place for a diversity. And one of the things that we didn't mention is how things have changed with social media as far as how many people go out to places. So Table Mountain can get very crowded, especially on the weekends. And uh, we always encourage people to be very respectful of the land and of the flowers and to stay on the trails. Um, when we used to go out at the beginning, we could be out for, we would go to out on the really big years for three to four weeks at a time. And there were some areas where we wouldn't see anyone. And now you have the Anza Borrego um, bloom where they had a five mile backup and, you know, tens of thousands of people heading out to the desert. Yeah, it's great that you uh, ask people to stay on the trails and respect the, the wildflowers and the natural spaces. Um, so another question is, 
Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your work with the Children of the Tenderloin project? Well, the Tenderloin at that time, back in 86, had gone from having uh, about 500 children to 5,000 children. And there was no school. And um, there had been, it was an influx of Asian families after the war and also um, the opening of homeless hotel rooms for homeless families. And so um, the uh, Bay Area Women's Resource Center wanted to uh, bring attention to that. And so I worked with them to create this project. They, they initiated it. And we brought a lot of attention to the area to, the, uh, to bring in more of the services that were needed. And I started out as a three month project and ended up being a two year project. So often my projects will get a lot bigger than I had planned. Thank you. Um, so another question is, have you explored vernal pools and their related flora? Yeah, um, there, there's an image in the, in the book of, of the vernal pool. It's on Mather Air Force Base, uh, with, you know, that base has been decommissioned. So there's protected now, I guess, public land there. And um, uh, yeah. The, it's really fascinating ecosystem. Right. I mean, the vernal pools are, are so interesting because as these pools with water in them dry out, um, you get these concentric rings of different types of flowers that appear as as the, as the soil dries out. So yeah, vernal pools are a wonderful place to uh, Yeah, photograph. if you get a chance to go. And 90% of vernal pools have been um, destroyed uh, due to development in agriculture. And, and it, they're created because the soil is not permeable. So the water pools rather than soaking into the ground. And that's what makes them so unique. So a related question that asks um, that most of your photos are in dry settings. Do you also photograph in riparian areas? Uh, well, that orchid, one of the orchids yes. was right next to a stream. Yeah. It's, it's more challenging. Um, because it's not as easy to access, but. Uh, a lot of our images aren't necessarily in dry areas, uh, like the image of the, uh, of the, uh, of the strawberry that was photographed in a forest. Uh, so, uh, um, I mean, the, the deserts have the greatest biodiversity. Uh, so that's why we're attracted to those areas because you can find more flowers more easily. You don't find the same uh, abundance of flowers in the same diversity as you do in forest, but we photographed in forest as well. And we photographed in uh, alpine areas. So um, yeah, we photographed in, in a lot of different areas, but, but specifically uh, when you talk about ripe riparian areas, not a whole lot because we don't find a lot of biodiversity there, but everything has its value and its unique flowers. Thank you. Um, so another question is, what is your favorite animal or insect that you have encountered on your adventures? Well, it's definitely not no pollinator. <laughs> <laughs> Has not no seams. Uh, well, probably our favorite insects are the different butterflies we've seen. Uh, we've seen so many different butterflies. The other thing is the crab spider, which uh, was on the milkweed that we showed earlier. On yellow flowers, they become bright yellow. And so they become the same color of the flowers. So that's, that's often really interesting. One of the nice things about photographing in the way that we do taking an hour to do a flower is that we do see insects come in. We, you know, with the, we were in a, in a desert wash in um, Joshua Tree National Park, uh, that area where we showed just a small Canterbury bells. We were there for about, what, three or four hours photographing different flowers in this, and this mockingbird 
was flying back and forth up, uh, uh, across the wash and it was like it was serenading us. And a mockingbird, you know, has very, 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 very different calls and sounds. So um, to be there for that long was just amazing to have that experience with the sound of the bird there. So I hope yeah, that answers when the you're, question. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I can imagine when you're in one place for a long time, you can really, you get all these animal and insect visitors that you wouldn't see when you're just walking down a trail. Um, I think we have there was time one for more, one more question. There was one and, more that um, I saw. Yeah, that was one more question. And I think it wraps up the event nicely. It's what is your next step? Well, we have several things in mind. Um, we have, um, we want to create a project, uh, an audio book for the visually impaired. So we can take them on our journey, photographing wildflowers, so that not only do we have the essays read, like most audio books, but Rob and I will also be describing images, um, describing what it what it looks like, what it uh, what it looks like to us, and um, what the environment was like, what the experience was like, so we can bring people um, along with us and help tell the flower story. And right now we're in a fundraising um, stage for that and also looking for partners to work with on that project. And then the other thing is um, looking at possibly doing some children's books related to uh, wildflowers and, and have uh, Zorro, Rob's spiritual advisor and art critic. The little beanie baby. Uh, be the narrator, being the narrator of the books. So that's 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 what we're looking at next. All right. Well, thank you both, um, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. As Robin Nita mentioned, um, you can buy the book at San Francisco Botanical Garden Bookstore. Uh, you can pick it up at the garden or buy it online. And the garden also has a really beautiful native plant garden where you can see some of these wildflowers and the peak bloom is April and May. So we hope to see you in the garden again soon. Here's another question. And, well, we really enjoyed doing the talk tonight. And again, if people wanna reach us, um, feel free to through our website. And um, the, Remember, California has wildflowers in certain areas all times of the year. You just have to slow down sometimes and, and really uh, look around. Can I answer one more question? Of course. Uh, someone said, what advice would you give to a photography hobbyist taking flowers in the San Francisco bo bo Botanical Garden? Um, well, I find if I take the time to just look around at very many different angles, make sure I'm avoiding dis, dis, distracting parts of a scene, like trees you may not want in there or branches or things. Um, it's really important to look at every part of the frame uh, to see what may be taking away from the feeling and the essence of the image that you're really looking for. So avoiding things that just don't seem to add to the composition is really an important thing. Uh, slowing down and just looking at everything and just paying attention to how one view feels versus something else. Because when we've been doing flowers and I've been doing portraits, there are so many different ways to look at a flower. And I find that I just trust my feeling you know, when something feels good, that's the time to make the image. So being aware of the emotions of the experience, uh, how it feels to look at something is really important. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. And also to look at the light, Yeah. Uh, whether you have distracting light or whether you actually want to uh, play around with a, with a diffusion disc, uh, which you can find online, or um, even use your body or your friend's body to shade something so that you don't have distracting light on it. Um, 
the other thing is to think about how close you want to get or further back. And if you're photographing with an iPhone, um, there are actually uh, small lenses you can buy, macro lenses that you can put on your iPhone so you can get in closer and do uh, macro work. So there are basically two kinds of, well, there's a lot of different kinds of photography in flowers, but there's the macro work, obviously, where you isolate just a flower or a few flower. Then there's a little bit of detail, and then there's the grand wide angle view. So I think one of the most important things would be have fun and be patient. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> explore and enjoy the exploring. But patience for me was something I really had that allowed me to get what it was I wanted. So, um, and it's just playful, you know. Recently, we took a hike up Ring Mountain in Corte Madera. Actually, earlier in the season, it was just the two of us. And it took us eight and a half hours to go two, two and a half miles. And so, and because we kept stopping to photograph. And when we go with friends, we can't do that. And so it might be a two and a half hour hike instead of an eight and a half hour. Hike. Oh, that's another good piece of advice. Um, if 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 you're a photography hobbyist, make sure if you've got someone with you that they share your interest and they're patient because uh, being aware of someone else's uh, 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 presence there and what their needs are as far as what the experience is may be different from yours if they're not photographing. I'm just so fortunate that, I, that I've, I've got a photo sweetie and, uh, you know, we're patient with each other. So sometimes who you bring can determine what your experience is if your intent is to just photograph. God, we said a lot. I hope that, <laughs> I hope that helps. <laughs> And, and look into joining local uh, photo clubs. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that's inspired people to get out, explore, um, take risks, photograph wildflowers. And then I hope that leads people to conserve our beautiful open spaces. So I really appreciate you guys joining us tonight. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank Thanks you. everyone for joining us. And thank you for inviting us. We appreciate it. And for everybody who's, who attended. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.